Hi everyone. So this week we are focusing on the 1920s and the Great Depression and we're going to be spending most of the time today talking about uh, the 20s and kind of what a contradictory decade it was. Uh, and then towards the end I'll get to talking into uh, how we go from the kind of prosperity of the 1920s into the Great Depression. And we'll be continuing uh, our discussion of this era of the Great Depression uh, next time after our uh, spring break, we'll get back into and talking about the New Deal and how the government attempted to combat the, uh, the problem of the Great Depression. So uh, to get us started today talking about the 1920s, these are some of the big questions we're going to be thinking about. Was the 1920s a radical or conservative decade? Uh, what were the causes of the Great Depression and how did the government initially respond to the economic crisis? So when you think of the 1920s, what sort of things come to mind? Probably flappers, speakeasies, jazz music. Our popular image of the 1920s can really be summed up in the nicknames that the decade has earned. Nicknames like the Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age, the New Era. Uh, and certainly the 1920s was a decade in which America kind of fully completes the transition from the world of the 19th century into the world of the 20th century. But this process was neither easy nor uncontested. Many Americans still were attempting to cling to a more traditional vision of America and a traditional way of life, the America and the way of life that they had always known. So the 1920s can largely be thought of as a decade of contradictions, a period where there are, you see enormous and very sweeping changes in American life, but also a period of reactionary conservative responses to those changes. So that's what we're going to explore uh, in the first part of today's lecture. Now, above all, when we think of the 1920s, we think of this as being an era of enormous economic prosperity. Uh, and that can really be summed up in President Coolidge's famous saying, the business of America is business. And we've been talking about this enormous growth in American industry in the late 19th century. And this process culminates in many ways in the 1920s. Americans by the 1920s had the highest living standard of any nation on earth. Uh, the decade saw an enormous economic boom that really peaks in 1927, and it lasts all the way up to the stock market crash in 1929. Now, of course, in the late 19th century, we saw this kind of, you know, process of industrialization. The power of steam is harnessed to run heavy machinery. By the 1920s, it's electricity that's replacing steam. Uh, by 1929, 70% of all industrial power is coming from electricity. And the modern assembly line is also something that was first introduced uh, in 1913 in Henry Ford's auto plant at Highland Park. And he perfected it uh, in his later factory that he built at River Rouge. Other manufacturers copied his methods, and soon moving assembly lines became standard in almost all factories. And so the emphasis here was on uniformity, on speed, on precision, on coordination. And... The things that were sort of lost were individual craftsmanship. Uh, it kind of accelerates the process of turning workers into simply another part of the machine. Production per hour increased 75% over the decade of the 1920s. And in 1929, you see the same size workforce as in 1919 is producing nearly twice as many goods. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Mm. So this enormous production brought about enormous profits for manufacturers, and we also see that it lowers the prices on consumer goods. New technologies meant new industries. Having electricity means that you can now have items like washing machines and vacuum cleaners and refrigerators and electric stoves and other household appliances that are supposed to ease the burden of housework and make life more leisurely for people. <coughs> we also see the radio and the movie industry booming uh, in the 1920s. Americans begin to enjoy radios in their own homes. They begin to go out to the movies. And there's a whole new spectrum of products to buy. So this also produces some important structural changes as well. 
the corporation continues to be the dominant economic unit in the 1920s, and now these corporations are huge. They have thousands of stockholders. They're making enormous profits, they, and this enables them to grow internally. They no longer have to rely on investment bankers as much. And so we start to see uh, kind of a wave of mergers during the 20s. It meant that the largest corporations were owning nearly half of the nation's corporate wealth. There's also a new emphasis on marketing. Public relations and the advertising industry really develops in the 1920s for the first time. And these advertising experts were tasked with creating a consumer society to buy all of those goods that were being created in the factories. They identify happiness with consumption. And we start to see kind of uniformity and standardization becoming the order of the day. Now, a person in rural Kansas can buy the same kind of car, they can buy the same brand of canned goods, they can buy the same dress as a resident of New York City. Uh, we start to see large chain stores coming into, uh, into play, and they're crowding out smaller shops. So we see regionalism and different sectional and geographical cultures start to decline. And so it's becoming kind of a mass culture as well. So all of this kind of comes together in the 1920s to create the economic boom that the decade is really known for. What we start to see in the 20s is really this divide between urban America and rural America. Uh, as with industrial growth, the 1920s witnesses this culmination and continuation of trends toward urbanization that begins in the late 19th century. The city is replacing the countryside as the focal point of American life. Uh, in 1920, the national census revealed that for the first time, the majority of Americans are living in cities. Now, this is pretty broadly defined as places with more than 2,500 people, uh, but still, that's a big change, right? Uh, Americans are coming to the cities more and more. They're seeking jobs in the new consumer industries. The nation's largest cities are growing the most rapidly. New York, uh, which you can see on the left here, is gr uh, growing by nearly 25%. Detroit, the center of the automobile industry, more than doubles its population during this decade. And skyscrapers really symbolize this new urban mass culture. The picture on the left is a picture of the Chrysler Building in New York, which was completed in 1930. Uh, and for about a year, it was the tallest building in, New York, in the world until it was passed by the Empire State Building in 1931. Life was different in these new metropolises. Uh, you had the older kind of communal ties of your home, your family, your church, your school. These things were absent. You saw new ideas, new creativity, new perspectives replacing those kind of older life. And so throughout the 1920s, Americans kind of find themselves caught between the urban culture and the rural culture. Urban life is considered to be this kind of world of anonymous crowds, strangers. It's a place where you can make money. It's a place where you can seek all the kind of pleasures that are available to, to life. Rural life is kind of considered to be more traditional. It's safe. You have close family ties. It's kind of guided by hard work and traditional morality. And so there is very much this kind of clash of cultures between urban versus rural in the 1920s. Now, much of what we think about when we think about the 20s is the popular culture and the atmosphere of frivolity and pleasure-seeking excess that seems to dominate the decade. Uh, in some sense, American mass popular culture is born in the 1920s because this was the first era you really had a national mass media. You had magazines, you had radio, you had movies. Americans had more leisure time as well during this decade, and many people were determined that they were going to use that time to enjoy themselves. So you see sports becoming a national obsession. Baseball, boxing, uh, golf become really, really popular. Uh, you start to see kind of this popular yearning for excitement and fame prompts this sort of thrill-seeking attitude, this kind of obsessive interest in celebrities and becoming famous and somewhat bizarre fads that kind of take the nation by storm, things like flagpole sitting, which seem very strange to us today. I mean, why would somebody go up a flagpole and just sit there for as long as they could? But then if you think about, you know, sort of today's YouTube culture and all of the, uh, you know, sort of fads and kind of uh, trends that get sort of passed on through YouTube, uh, 
it's the same sort of thing, right? You see, during the 20s, you see standards of Victorian morality begin to crumble. You see sexuality becomes a popular topic of interest, and it's more freely discussed in the 20s than it was uh, in earlier decades. For example, movies in Hollywood in the 20s, if you look at the movies that were made in the 20s, they are much, much more sexually explicit than they would be in the 1930s after the advent of the Hayes Code, which was designed to kind of censor uh, the content of movies in Hollywood. And all of this is particularly popular, popular, not unsurprisingly, with young people who are kind of rebelling against the morality of their parents. They're using their newfound freedom that they get through being able to kind of drive anywhere they want in the automobile to explore kind of sexuality and freedom. So it becomes this very, you know, kind of uh, self-reinforcing thing. Now, all of this frivolity, this consumption, this new spirit of permissiveness is challenged. And it's challenged by, you know, sort of traditional, moral, rural people who, you know, kind of look down upon uh, all of this, you know, kind of excess. But it's also challenged by intellectuals of the time. Uh, intellectuals, a number of them, became so turned off by American society and values that they thought it doesn't even, you know, sort of... There's no point in even trying to reform this society that's just been completely taken over by consumerism and excess. Uh, and so you see a lot of writers in the 20s commenting on this new industrial society. They are disillusioned because of the First World War. They are really bewildered by the rapidly changing social patterns, and they're really appalled by the materialism that seems to dominate American culture. Some of these writers end up leaving America altogether. Uh, they go to live in Europe as expatriates, um, particularly in Paris. Um, and you can see there in the top, uh, the top row, the photograph in the middle, that's Ernest Hemingway there, uh, sitting with a bunch of his friends at a Paris cafe. Uh, and the best example of the kind of disaffected intellectual of the 1920s was a guy named H.L. Mencken. Um, and he became kind of the leading social critic of the decade. Uh, and some of his definitions kind of illustrate uh, his really kind of sarcastic, biting wit. He's the guy who said, a Puritan is anyone with an awful fear that somewhere someone is enjoying himself. Uh, or, uh, for example, love is the delusion that one woman differs from another. So he had this very kind of dry, very cutting sarcasm uh, that he used to criticize just about every aspect of American culture in the 1920s. Uh, so the... At the same time we see all this kind of cultural criticism, there was really an intellectual and cultural explosion in the 1920s, and it was broad, and the kind of culture that's created in the 1920s really makes very enduring contributions to American cultural life. Art, and especially music, made significant advances as well. Probably the most significant contribution is the spread of jazz. It's brought into American popular culture by African Americans who are now migrating to the North. Uh, and it's really the first authentic national folk music. Jazz begins to be exported all around the world, and jazz styles are embraced by white classical composers like George Gershwin, whom you can see on the bottom there. Uh, you also see artists uh, trying to capture kind of the urbanization, the, the sort of alienation of, of city life in the 1920s. Uh, so you see this kind of reflected in art as well. One of the things that people really think of when they think of the 1920s is prohibition, uh, the passage of the 18th Amendment in 1920. And this amendment launches this era known as prohibition. So this new law made it illegal to manufacture, sell, or transport any kind of alcoholic beverage. And this was something that had been long uh, coming for a long time uh, in American uh, society. Uh, there had been an effort to kind of curtail or cut back on the amount of alcohol being consumed by people ever since the, really the early kind of 19th century. Uh, but they finally kind of culminates in the passage of the 18th Amendment. You have a lot of urban reformers during the progressive era. They're concerned over the kind of... Uh, 
alcoholism and the you know, sort of the social ills that it creates, especially among industrial workers. Uh, this was also very much supported in rural America, particularly in the South and the West. Um, and so it was, you know, it had a pretty broad, uh, you know, sort of form of support throughout the country. The major anti-alcohol uh, organizations were the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, those were the two big groups that pushed for prohibition. Now, prohibition was pretty easily adopted in rural America, but the problem was extending this so-called noble experiment to the cities. Many Americans, particularly people who lived in cities, they weren't particularly religious. Uh, they didn't believe drinking was a sin. Prohibition was deeply resented by immigrant groups, such as the Germans and the Irish, uh, for whom drinking was really kind of a part of their culture. And it's almost totally disregarded by wealthy urban Americans. Now, prohibition did, in fact, actually lead to a decline in drinking. There were a number of areas throughout the country, especially in the rural parts of America, that became totally dry. Uh, and in cities, the consumption of alcoholic beverages dropped very sharply among the lower classes who could not afford to buy bootleg liquor. But it becomes very fashionable among the middle and the upper classes who were the ones who were seeking out those speakeasies, those hidden saloons, and bootleggers to obtain alcohol illegally. And so they start to smuggle it in from abroad, from places like Canada, Cuba, the West Indies, or make it illegally here. And often the process was pretty dangerous. One of the groups that really capitalized on prohibition was organized crime. Uh, and prohibition ends up really kind of damaging American society because it really kind of breeds a disrespect for the law. Uh, it contributed to the growth of organized crime in every major American city, uh, and, but especially in places like Chicago, which becomes the notor very notorious as the home of Al Capone, whom you can see up there on the right. He becomes a very famous bootlegger, and he takes control of the Chicago liquor business by killing off his competition. So it's this urban resistance to prohibition that finally leads to its repeal. And it also ends up failing because the federal government never allocated enough resources to actually enforce the law. The task of enforcing prohibition fell to about 1,500 federal agents who were not very well paid, and clearly this was an impossible task. They had to enforce prohibition throughout the entire country, uh, which would be very, very difficult. By the mid-1920s, only 19% of Americans supported prohibition um, because it's really hard to legislate morality. People are going to kind of do what they want regardless of what the law says. Police in the cities were openly tolerating the traffic in alcohol. Bootleggers were bribing judges and officials to look the other way. Prohibition was kind of something that satisfied rural America's desire to control what they saw as kind of the excess of the urban centers. But America on the whole really suffered pr from prohibition. And finally, it was repealed in 1933 by the 21st Amendment. So we've been talking about how there's this clash of cultures between urban versus rural America, and you see that played out with prohibition. Uh, you also see it played out with religion. Uh, in particular. There's a clash in the 1920s between religious versus secular America. Many middle-class Americans, largely in the cities, they begin to turn toward what they what was called modernist religion. And this is kind of religion that emphasizes good works. It emphasizes respectability. So, you know, going to church is kind of a social act, um, as kind of a, a way to sort of make yourself seem kind of like a respectable person. Uh, they are interested in kind of looking at the Bible as a historical document more than as sort of the repository of all truth. And it's part of a general trend in intellectual circles away from believing in absolute truths and toward a more kind of relative, rational expl explanation. Um, and part of this is grounded in kind of a secularization of American culture and society that we see starting in the 1920s. Now against this is the kind of traditional religious, very hardcore religious beliefs of millions of Americans who feel alienated from the cities, from science, from modernization. And we see kind of a growth in, of a movement in Protestant Christianity known as fundamentalism. And fundamentalists believe that the Bible is literally true and that it contains all the truths that are necessary to live a good and moral life. 
So the Protestant movement kind of becomes grounded in this literal interpretation of the Bible that becomes known as fundamentalism. And science is a particular uh, battleground for religious versus secular Americans in the 1920s. Uh, and it's most famously represented in the Scopes trial in 1925, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. So according to fundamentalists, one of the key modernist attacks on, these, on their traditional religious beliefs came from the realm of science. And this is a period when there are a huge advancements coming in science uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. This really fuels kind of the modernization of America. Americans are increasingly placing their faith in the authority of science and progress. I mean, that was what the progressive movement was all about, right? It was sort of using scientific expertise to better society. There's a growing acceptance of Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, by the 1920s, the evolution theory had started to enter the nation's public school classrooms. And fundamentalists, of course, are very much opposed to this. They believe that evolution contradicts the biblical story of creation, and therefore it's blasphemous, particularly the idea that humans had evolved from lower forms of life. And so they're the ones who are kind of leading the charge against evolution, particularly the teaching of evolution in school. So this kind of brings us to this really sort of odd episode in American history, which is known as the Scopes Trial. Now, the actual history of the Scopes Trial is very different from what you may know about it. Uh, you might have read or watched the play Inherit the Wind uh, when you were in high school. I know I did. Uh, we had to read the play. Uh, and it's about sort of this, it's kind of a loose adaptation of what happened with the Scopes trial. Uh, but the, the story that it presents is very different from what actually happened. So what actually happened? Well, uh, in the 1920s, a number of southern states turned to legislation to try to keep the theory of evolution out of their classrooms. And such a law was introduced in Tennessee in 1925. Uh, it was known as the Butler Act, and it made it unlawful for teachers in public schools to, quote, teach any theory that denies the story of divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. And violating this law was a misdemeanor. It was punishable uh, by a fine of around $100 to $500 for each offense. Now, in response to the passage of laws like the Butler Act, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, which is at, th at the time was a relatively new organization, it was looking to exert its influence, uh, and they were... They took up the cause. They advertised for teachers who were willing to challenge this law in court. Now, a group of civic boosters in a small town in Tennessee, the town of Dayton, uh, they were looking to boost the image for their town. So they saw that the ACLU was offering uh, this, you know, offering to defend any of these teachers who were willing to challenge the law. So they, they, this group of civic boosters went to the local science teacher, a guy named John Scopes, and he was a science teacher. He was also the assistant football coach, uh, and he, they persuaded him to accept the ACLU's offer. Now, Scopes opposed the Butler Act on philosophical grounds. He, he was a, he was pro-teaching evolution. Um, he didn't have a lot to lose personally. He was young. He was single. Uh, he wasn't intending to stay in Dayton for the rest of his life. And he was very likable. Uh, he was popular in the town. He had, had otherwise conventional views. Uh, so the Scopes trial, uh, as I said, so in March 20, 1925, Tennessee passes this law, making it a crime to teach evolution. The ACLU promises to defend any teacher willing to challenge the law. Uh, civic boosters in Dayton persuade John Scopes to accept their offer. And the Scopes trial became about much more than just John Scopes. So it became this kind of media event. Uh, supporters and opponents of the anti-evolution law uh, and the national media just converge upon Dayton from all around the country. Uh, and it becomes kind of this national sensation. 
the supporters of the law uh, brought the renowned uh, speaker, John, William Jennings Bryan. Uh, he was this very fervent Christian fundamentalist to assist the prosecution. Now, you might remember William Jennings Bryan when we all the way back when we talked about the populace, right? He was the guy who gave that cross of gold speech advocating for uh, putting the U.S. on a uh, on a gold uh, on a mixed monetary standard, not just using gold, but using silver as well. And he was a failed presidential candidate. He actually ran for president a number of times and never kind of ended up winning uh, the election. So Brian is brought in. He is a leading opponent of the teaching of evolution, uh, really since the early 1920s. On the other side, Clarence Darrow, uh, he's one of America's leading, most famous trial lawyers at the time. He ends up volunteering his services for the defense. Darrow was the kind of guy who loved defending unpopular causes, and he was a very vocal and outspoken critic of Christian fundamentalists, particularly Brian. So he kind of takes up the, the cause of the other side. Reporters, including the journalist and the professional cynic H.L. Mencken, also come to Dayton. And the trial is dubbed the Monkey Trial, and it becomes this kind of media circus. Uh, the prosecution argues that the state had this constitutional right to set the curriculum in public schools. Now, the question was whether Scopes had violated the Butler Act by covering the theory of evolution in his classroom. And witnesses for the prosecution, including several of Scopes' students, got up and testified that, yes, indeed, he had taught the theory. Darrow and the defense, they argued that this anti-evolution law violated the Tennessee Constitution as well as the First Amendment, the guarantee for freedom of speech and the provision for the separation of church and state. And they also contended that the law violated the 14th Amendment declaration that no state should be permitted to pass any law that abridged any citizen's privileges. Now, they wanted to introduce scientific evidence supporting the theory of evolution by calling scientists to the witness stand. The prosecution said no. They argued that the case is not about proving whether or not the theory of evolution is correct. And the judge ended up siding with the prosecution. So the defense wasn't allowed to bring their scientific experts. Uh, so denied this opportunity to call on expert witnesses, uh, Darrow takes the rather unusual step of calling William Jennings Bryan the member, the leading member of the prosecuting team, to take the stand as an expert witness on the Bible. Brian had given a very fiery speech defending the state's right to determine the curriculum and affirming the teachings of the Bible. So the judge, this was what everybody had been waiting for, right? This was, you know, the judge basically decides, okay, let's let Darrow and Brian go at each other. So Darrow begins to question Brian on whether he believes everything in the Bible is literally true. He starts asking him to interpret passages of the Bible. And the exchange grows pretty nasty at times. Both sides are kind of insulting each other's beliefs. Uh, the examination lasts two hours. It doesn't really have anything at all to do with the case at hand, but it has everything to do with this larger battle between secularists and fundamentalists. Uh, and... The judgments about who kind of gained the upper hand here vary depending upon the source. Some thought that Darrow had humiliated Brian. Others thought that Brian had ended up kind of holding his own. Scopes was eventually convicted of violating the law. He was fined $100. He never went to jail, uh, despite what the, the uh, play and then later the film shows. The trial settles nothing. Uh, the defense actually ended up appealing his conviction. It ended up being set aside on a technicality. The anti-evolution law was left on the books for another 40 years. And both sides were kind of claiming moral victory here. And we see that really the result was just that the rift between fundamentalists and secular Americans grows even wider. Now, after the Scopes trial, fundamentalism is really discredited in a lot of urban America, but it gains ground in the rural areas. It's not as visible, uh, at least for a long period of time in American life, but it's gaining strength and it's kind of growing even stronger.
One of the other trends that we see happening in the 20s is a new role for women in society. Uh, the role for women in the family and society is changing during the 1920s. Uh, in 1920, of course, with the passage of the 19th Amendment, women had finally won the right to vote. And many Americans, including those who both favored women's suffrage and those who were opposed to it, they had thought that women gaining the right to vote was going to bring about sweeping changes in American society. But most of those changes never end up materializing. Now that the amendment had been passed, the women's movement no longer has a unifying cause. And so it begins to break apart into different factions who want different goals. And it's thought, it was thought prior to the passage of the amendment that women would end up voting together as a kind of a block to pass influential reforms. But it turns out that women ended up not doing that. Uh, a lot of times they would vote the same way that their fathers or their husbands did. But some parts of the women's movement continued during the 1920s to push for further equality. Alice Paul, uh, one of the more militant veterans of the suffrage movement, she ends up organizing the National Women's Party. And she lobbies after the passage of the, of the 19th Amendment. She ends up lobbying for the passage of another amendment that is supposed to grant women full equality under the law. Uh, it becomes known as the Equal Rights Amendment. And it states very simply, men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject to its jurisdiction. Now, Paul ends up lobbying for this passage of this act, but other women's organizations, mainly those who are interested in passing legislation that is going to protect women's women and children in the workplace, they end up being opposed to the ERA because they think it's going to threaten that legislation. So the ERA ends up getting stalled in Congress, and women's groups have continued to bring it up over the next, really, you know, ever since it was uh, first introduced in the 1920s, but it has yet to be passed. It is awfully close, though. Uh, we almost have, I think, the last state that's needed to actually ratify the amendment uh, is going to be, I think, voting on it, you know, sort of pretty soon, uh, whether or not they're actually going to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, women's push for greater political rights during the 1920s ends up stalling, but some women, uh, particularly the younger generation, they start to move toward more cultural and social equality. Uh, and we see kind of this concentration on individual self-expression, this rebellion against Victorian attitudes about how a proper woman should dress and act. And of course, these were known as the flappers. And they become this kind of enduring icon of the 1920s. They cut their hair short in a style that's known as the bob. Uh, they wore shorter skirts, skirts above the knee. They smoke and drank in public. They wore makeup. Uh, they danced uh, in public, wild new dances like the Charleston. They attack the traditional double standard uh, in terms of sexuality. They assert that sexual fulfillment before marriage is a right for women as well as for men. We start to see divorce rates rising dramatically during the 20s. So we see the kind of real new role for women uh, coming into play uh, during this decade. We also see uh, changes for African Americans as well. Uh, one of the things that we talked about last time with the First World War is that you see African Americans starting to move out of the South and into the urban centers of the North and the Midwest in large numbers. And this continues throughout the 20s. Harlem in New York becomes the largest black urban community. Now, it's a place that suffers from overcrowding, unemployment, poverty. So it is really kind of, you know, a uh, it's it's not the the you know, sort of greatest place to live, but it becomes the center of an artistic and literary movement known as the Harlem Renaissance. The leader, the famous African-American intellectual, W.E.B. Du Bois, he's a leader of the black community in Harlem, and the NAACP moves its headquarters there. In 1923, the Urban League, another civil rights organization, begins publishing a magazine uh, that is devoted to scholarly studies of racial issues. We also see uh, issues like black nationalism and immigration to Africa becoming really popular issues at the time. The Harlem Renaissance is primarily a literary movement. 
Uh, and it's led by very well-educated African-Americans who are kind of expressing this new sense of pride in the African-American experience. Uh, some of the kind of more leading figures of the movement, Claude McKay, he was a poet. Uh, his poems kind of express the pain of life uh, in these kind of urban centers, which are, uh, you know, sort of heavily African-American. Langston Hughes' poems describe the difficult lives of working-class African-Americans. Zora Neale Hurston, she was an author and also a folklorist, uh, and she focuses on the culture of African-Americans, their folkways and values, and she kind of celebrates that. So we see African-American literature and art really blossoming in Harlem. Uh, in 1922, uh, Claude McKay's collection of poetry uh, titled White Shadows becomes, you know, so this really celebrated uh, collection. And he really expresses resentment against the racial injustice and taking pride in his blackness that he feels. One of his most famous poems uh, was entitled If We Must Die, and it was actually written in response to the race riots that happened in 1919 in the wake of the First World War. And famously, the poem, the last part of the poem says, If we must die, oh, let us nobly die so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. Like men will face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. Uh, and you can see kind of the, the new sort of more militant spirit uh, being expressed in this poem. Langston Hughes was also another famous literary figure of the Harlem Renaissance, and his poetry celebrates uh, the black working class experience and emphasizes this pride in being African American. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance also includes women as well as men. Uh, probably the most famous female writer of the movement was Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, she published the novel Their Eyes Were Watching God, uh, which some of you may have read before. Uh, she studied anthropology, uh, and she puts her knowledge to use in kind of this celebration of traditional African-American culture. So there's this new... African-American cultural awareness, it's concentrated in Harlem, it spreads to other cities around the country, and you start to see more African-Americans uh, becoming, you know, sort of more well-educated, they're graduating from colleges, they're kind of, you know, expressing their pride in being African-American uh, during, this, during this decade. Now, while the Harlem Renaissance is going on, we also see kind of the flip side of that is the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan, the second Klan, uh, starts in Georgia in 1915, and its membership grows pretty slowly at first, but after 1920, when there are all these fears uh, after, in the post-war period of kind of, you know, uh, you know, racial tensions, ethnic tensions, anti-immigration sentiment, and they have some pretty shrewd promotional techniques, so their membership ends up starting to grow. And it's primarily an organization of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men who are anxious about the way their society is changing. Now, the Klan of the 1920s is very different uh, from the Klan of the post-Civil War era that we talked about when we talked about Reconstruction. For one thing, it's not confined to the South. It spreads all around the country. Uh, and some of these places, uh, the picture on the right there, I believe, is a picture of the Klan, of a Klan gathering in Michigan. Uh, in addition, it's much more centrally organized than the earlier Klan. There is a national leadership. There's a very rigid structure uh, with a very strict hierarchy uh, in terms of the, the kind of governance of the body. Finally, uh, the Klan in the 1920s is not just anti-African American. Uh, Klansmen believed that there were many threats to traditional American culture, uh, including immigrants, Catholics, Jews, anybody who embraced the kind of new and freer urban culture as well uh, as African Americans. So they are concerned about the demise of traditional moral values. They're concerned about the loosening of parental authority over children, over the diminishing authority of men over women. So it's largely a reactionary movement. It's an attempt to protect what they see as their own values, and they're going to do it by force. So they end up punishing 
basically anybody who is, you know, failing to conform to those values. They punished African Americans who did not know their place, according to them. They published women, they punished women who embraced kind of the new moral standards of the day. They punished immigrants who failed to assimilate and conform to American society. And they very frequently used very violent tactics, including kidnapping, beating, murder. They also entered politics, and they gained control of a number of state legislatures. And so by 1925, the Klan had about 5 million members in it. And you can see this picture, this very famous photo uh, on the left, is a march of the Klan down Pennsylvania Avenue. Now, the resurgence of the Klan is really kind of just another symptom of this rural America that is feeling insecure and anxious in the 1920s. The Klan offers fellowship to people who want reassurance. They want to feel like they're still important. And the rituals and the practices of the Klan seem very odd, but they are designed to kind of give its followers a sense of belonging and identity. And it was sort of an all-encompassing organization. They included all members of the family, including women and children, uh, got involved in the organization. Now, just as the Klan seems to be on the rise, it starts to decline in the late 1920s. Uh, a lot of the more violent activities of the Klan uh, began to offend many Americans. Uh, there were a bunch of scandals that rocked the Klan's national leadership, including, you know, uh, economic scandals and also sex scandals. Uh, and so the rank and file members really become disillusioned uh, with the organization. And you see kind of counterattacks uh, kind of ousted the Klan from political control in some areas. And by the end of the 1920s, the Klan had kind of retreated. It di had disappeared from the national stage. But it's going to resurface again in the future. Uh, and this nativism and intolerance that the Klan is, si is kind of symbolic of is really symptomatic of the general atmosphere of the decade. Nativism is not just confined to the members of the Klan, but it's a widespread sentiment throughout the country. Um, and it really gets, you know, uh, highlighted in the debate over immigration that happens in the 1920s. There had been this sharp increase in immigration in the late 19th and early 20th century, and now we're seeing kind of this backlash, this broad-based movement to restrict immigration. So in 1917, Congress passes a literacy test that reduces the number of immigrants allowed into the country. Of course, during World War I, uh, that number, you know, cut back uh, drastically. After the war, a lot of people are afraid that there's going to be a new wave of immigrants. Uh, there were all these, you know, kind of people talking about a barbarian horde coming in, a foreign tide that is going to inundate the U.S. with dangerous and deadly enemies of the country. Now, the actual numbers don't really match the projections, but in 1921, Congress passes an Emergency Immigration Act, uh, and it puts a quota system that restricts immigration from Europe to 3% of the number of nationals from each country living in the U.S. in 1910. So you can see that reflected here in this political cartoon on the left. The nativists are still not satisfied with this. They are concerned about decli the declining percentage of immigrants from northern and western Europe, specifically. They're concerned that there are more people coming in from southern and eastern Europe. And so there are all these calls for so-called racial purity and maintaining the Anglo-Saxon stock of the country. So in 1924, Congress passes the National Origins Act, and this limits immigration from Europe to 150,000 people per year. And most of the available slots, as you can see in this table on the right, were given to immigrants from Great Britain and Ireland and Germany and Scandinavia. So northern and western Europe get the majority of the spaces. Uh, and all Asian immigrants from, you know, anywhere in Asia, really, were banned. Uh, and you can see that, you know, immigration from places like Poland and Italy and Russia are cut back, uh, you know, drastically. Uh, this quota system was in place until the 1960s, and it gets overwhelming support in the rural areas of America, even though 
most of these rural areas never saw any immigrants coming in there. Most of the immigrants were settling in the cities. And so you see in the debates over immigration in the 1920s, a lot of people saying, hey, you know, sort of, wait a minute, what are you talking about these dangerous immigrants that you're coming in? You know, you don't even have any immigrants in your particular, you know, town that you're living in. You know, sort of, you don't know anything about these immigrants because you've never even met one. Uh, but there were, you know, sort of these, you know, sort of real strong calls uh, from rural areas to restrict immigration. Now, Mexican immigrants, un interestingly enough, are exempt from the quota. You can see from the Western Hemisphere, there was no quota limit. Uh, and so they are exempt. And laborers from Mexico and from Central America continue to come northward, and they continue to fill the need for unskilled workers, mainly agricultural workers, people to come in and pick the crops that are being grown in the fields of California and Arizona and Texas. So you can see that, you know, sort of there's, interestingly enough, uh, in the 1920s, the issue was not the same group of immigrants uh, that we see today, but it, the language and the rhetoric being used is very similar. Now, this anti-immigrant sentiment in America runs very, very strong, and probably the most tragic example of this sentiment is the case of Sacco and Vanzetti. Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti are two Italian-born American anarchists. And they are arrested and tried and executed via electrocution in Massachusetts for the charge of murder and theft. And critics of this trial have accused the prosecution and the trial judge of allowing anti-Italian, anti-immigrant, anti radical sentiment to influence the jury's verdict. The judge in the case, a guy named Webster Thayer, he actually stated to the jury, this man, he was referencing Vanzetti at the time, although he may not have actually committed the crime attributed to him, is nevertheless culpable because he is the enemy of our existing institutions. So that's a rather incredible statement, right? Here we have the judge in the trial saying, hey, this guy who we're trying here, he might not have actually committed the crime, but you should find him guilty anyway because he's an immigrant and he is different and he's not assimilating to American culture. So these two men were followers of an Italian anarchist who advocated revolutionary violence, including bombing and assassination. Uh, so these were not, you know, so necessarily the greatest guys. I mean, they were, you know, they were anarchists. They ranked at the, t and at the time, they, the anarchists were really at the top of the government's list of dangerous enemies. And they had been identified as suspects in several violent bombings and assassination attempts. But it's unclear whether Sacco and Vanzetti were actually at all involved in the activities that they were arrested for. Now, in the trial, the jury deliberated for only three hours uh, for com before coming back with a guilty verdict. And appeals and protests and denials uh, continued for really the next six years. The prosecution staunchly defended the verdict, but the defense found that there were huge reasons for doubt. Uh, there were lots of, you know, sort of really suspect things that went on in this trial. Three of the key prosecution witnesses later admitted that they had been coerced into identifying Sacco at the scene of the crime. When confronted by the DA, they changed their stories again. They denied that they had been coerced. Uh, and in 1924, it was discovered that someone had switched the barrel of Sacco's gun. Uh, and... It was never solved at, you know, how this actually ended up happening. Uh, other appeals focused on the jury foreman uh, and the ballistics expert that the prosecution brought in. In 1923, the defense filed an affidavit from the friend of the, from a friend of the jury foreman who swore that prior to the trial, the man had said of Sacco and Vanzetti, damn them, they ought to hang them anyway. So obviously, this was a guy who, you know, sort of had a prejudgment uh, and he, you know, sort of was not going to be objective and listen to the evidence. Uh, that same year, a state police captain retracted his trial testimony that linked Sacco's gun to the fatal bullet that, sh that sh uh, was, you know, implicated in the crime. 
Now, there was this growing conviction that Sacco and Vanzetti deserved a new trial. Uh, and adding to that was the conduct of the trial judge himself, Webster Thayer. During the trial, many people noted how Thayer seemed to really hate their def Sacco and Vanzetti's defense attorney. Uh, he frequently denied uh, the guy's motions. He kind of, uh, the, the, their lawyer was from California, and he's, the judge started lecturing him on how law is conducted in Massachusetts. On at least two occasions out of court, Thayer was known to have, you know, kind of ranted about uh, this, you know, sort of their, their defense attorney. He said, uh, no long-haired anarchist from California can run this court. So he had this, he really had it out for the defense. Uh, and according to people who later swore affidavits to the effect, Thayer also uh, called Sacco and Vanzetti Bolsheviks. And he said he would get them good and proper. Following the verdict, a reporter from the Boston Globe uh, wrote a scathing protest to the Massachusetts Attorney General condemning this really blatant bias on the part of the judge. Um, and then in 1924, uh, after denying all five motions for a new trial, Thayer uh, confronted a Massachusetts lawyer uh, and he said, did you see what I did with those anarchic bastards the other day? The judge said, I guess that will hold them for a while. Let them go to the Supreme Court now and see what they can get out of them. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, sort of this really made it seem like Sacco and Vanzetti had not received a fair trial. Now, they themselves, Sacco and Vanzetti themselves, both claimed to be victims of social and political prejudice. Uh, they both claimed that they were innocent of the crime for which they were accused. But, interestingly enough, they did not attempt to distance themselves from their fellow anarchists, uh, nor their belief in violence as a legitimate weapon against the government. And at the end of the trial, Vanzetti famously said, uh, he famously made a very moving speech uh, before the court, and he said, I would not wish to a dog or a snake, the most low and misfortunate creature of the earth, I would not wish to any of them what I have had to suffer for things that I am not guilty of. But my conviction is that I have suffered for things that I am guilty of. I am suffering because I am a radical, and indeed I am a radical. I have suffered because I am an Italian, and indeed I am an Italian. If you could execute me two times, and if I could be reborn two other times, I would live again to do what I have done already." So the court was very moved by this speech, but in spite of protests and strikes all over the world, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti were executed uh, on August 23rd, 1927. And the trial really was kind of a symbol of the intolerance and the nativism and the anti-immigrant sentiment that really marks the decade of the 1920s. All right, so we've talked a lot about how the 1920s is this kind of decade of contradictions. Uh, it's a time in which, you know, sort of there's all this booming economy. Uh, it's a time in which, you know, sort of American culture is blossoming and thriving, but it's also a time where there's an enormous amount of nativism, where there's an enormous amount of uh, intolerance, uh, you know, for people who are seen to be, you know, destroying America's traditional values. Um, and so I'm going to talk, move now to talking about how do we go from the 1920s into the Great Depression. So we've already talked about how the 1920s seems to be a very rosy time economically. Everybody's spending, spending, spending. There's lots of new industries. There's lots of new consumer goods. Everything seems to be hunky-dory on the surface. But if we look a little deeper, we can see that the seeds for the economic collapse that we see at the end of the decade and into the 1930s are planted and they're already beginning to grow during the 1920s. We have this revolution in consumer goods, right? Behind that, there's a decline in a lot of the traditional industries that had fueled the American economy. Uh, the railroad industry, for example, uh, is facing a lot of competition from the growing automobile industry. The coal industry is facing the advent of petroleum and natural gas. You have cotton textiles. They are declining with the development of synthetic fibers. Uh, and what we see here, we start to see the decline of industrial New England that had been the nation's oldest industrial center. Factories are beginning to move south. They're looking for cheaper labor. This leaves thousands of unemployed workers uh, in, the, in New England and you know, really near ghost towns. 
farmers are also really suffering during the 1920s. Uh, during World War I, American farmers had expanded their production to meet the wartime needs of both America and Europe. The U.S. was literally feeding Europe throughout the war. Once the war is over, however, and you know Europe gets back on its feet, there's this sharp cutback in exports, and this causes prices and thus farmers' incomes to really fall dramatically. So farmers at the agricultural sector of the economy is doing terribly throughout most of the 1920s. Urban workers are better off than the farmers, but they're still not fully sharing in the decade's affluence. Even though the economy is growing, the industrial labor force doesn't grow in size along with it because all of these technological innovations mean that the same number of workers can produce much more than before. And most new jobs that were created in the 1920s were in kind of lower paying service industry type jobs. Wages aren't rising very much either because uh, you have organized labor is really at its weakest point in the 1920s. The leadership of unions was not very active. They really weren't organizing unskilled workers in some of these mass production industries. And this is the era of business. The entire culture seems to be opposed to the idea of unionization. Management was able to portray unions as these kind of radical organizations after the strikes of 1919 that we talked about last time. And they're able to use the courts. They're able to use, you know, so to write contracts forbidding unions to, forbidding workers to join unions. Uh, they deny workers the benefits of collective bargaining. Uh, other employers use techniques of what was called welfare capitalism. Uh, and basically this is corporations spending money to improve conditions in their factories, to give workers benefits, uh, and to organize what were called company unions. And so this has the effect of making unions, independent unions, and the necessity of striking obsolete. So we see union membership really declining during the decade from 5 million to less than 3 million by 1929. Now, the middle and the upper classes, though, are thriving. Managers, engineers, bankers, executives, they are directing this new industrial economy, and they're the ones reaping the benefits. Corporate profits double, uh, incomes are rising, and there's all this conspicuous consumption, and this really helps to fuel the prosperity of the 1920s. But disposable income becomes greater than material wealth, and this results in rampant speculation. People begin to invest very heavily in the stock market, and you can see that in this advertisement here on the left. And so, and then there's the idea of buying things on credit. Many people are able to participate in this new consumer culture only because they're able to say that they could buy something now and pay for it later. So this results in increased consumer debt as well. Now, all of these factors are danger signs on the horizon for the American economy, but there are very few people at the time who recognize them. Americans are caught up in this exhilarating economic expansion in the Roaring Twenties. They can't see that there's this economic instability underlying all this growth. And you can really see that reflected in this advertisement on the right. This is actually a political ad for Herbert Hoover and his running mate, Charles Curtis, uh, and they are billing themselves as being able to kind of continue the prosperity that America is uh, seeing in the 1920s. They are going to come in and they're going to just continue this prosperity. Uh, Hoover, fa Hoover famously said that, you know, sort of America was going to have a chicken in every pot. Um, and he was going to promise that that was going to be something that people would be able to, c to count on. So Americas are really struggling to enter the modern era at this time. Uh, and what we see is that the Depression is kind of a big shock to most Americans who thought they'd been enjoying nearly a decade of unprecedented economic growth. We had this consumer revolution that had fostered confidence that things are getting better and that they're going to continue to improve. Uh, and when the stock market collapses, when factories start to close, when unemployment begins to skyrocket, the optimism really just kind of shatters. So, as I mentioned, the seeds for the Depression are planted during the boom of the 1920s. Essentially, the problem is that the production is growing faster than the demand. There are more and more goods being produced, and not enough people can buy them. 
And the problem is that no one is really far-sighted enough to see the warning signs here. Corporate leaders could have responded to the slowdown in the economy by uh, raising wages, by lowering prices. Government officials could have forced people to stop buying things on credit, could have cut back on bank loans. Mm. This might have forestalled the worst effects of the Depression. Uh, so what actually happens? Well, the Fed, as the Federal Reserve Board is lowering interest rates, they're charging banks less for loans in an attempt to stimulate the economy. But this additional credit, people aren't putting this into their bank accounts. They are investing in the stock market. And this touches off this huge new wave of speculation in, in the late 1920s that obscures this growing economic slowdown. Uh, and so people with extra money begin to put that money into the stock market. They're encouraged because they see stock values just going up, 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 up. In reality, not that many Americans actually own stock, but the fact that the market is going to just rising and rising and rising, it captures the nation's attention. And it assures Americans that, hey, the economy is healthy. It's going great. Nothing to see here. No, no worries. And so people are not doing analysis of the underlying flaws. So then on October 24th, 1929, uh, this date later came to be known as Black Thursday, stock prices begin to decline. Investors start to get nervous. They begin to sell. The leading stocks plunge. They lose nearly half of their value in a single day. And then people just begin to panic, and this causes prices to fall even further. Within weeks, all of the gains of the previous two years had vanished. Now, this stock market crisis and the crash really directly affects only about 3 million Americans. But indirectly, it spills over into the larger economy because banks had invested in the stock market as well. And so they have suffered heavy losses in the market. They were forced to cut back lending for consumer purchases. And because no one could buy their goods, manufacturers cut back on production. They began to lay off workers. And so this lowered people's purchasing power even further. And so basically what happens is this kind of vicious downward spiral that really continues for four years. So by 1932, really at the height of the Great Depression, unemployment in the United States is at 25%, which is an staggeringly astonishingly high number. The gross national product had fallen to 67% of the level that it had been at 1929. So this is a huge shock. And the Great Depression is really nothing less than the total collapse of the American economy. But why did it collapse? Essentially, it's that the new 1920s economy is, has failed to distribute wealth broadly enough. The U.S. factories are producing more goods than the American people can consume. And it's not so much that the market is saturated, but that millions of Americans cannot afford to buy the goods because there's not enough money going into the pockets of ordinary people. Too much money had gone into profits, into dividends, into stock speculation, and not enough had gone into the hands of the workers, who were also consumers and who could have, if they had been paid enough, bought the goods that they were producing. So productivity increases during the 1920s 43%. Wages only go up by 11%. So you can see there's this enormous imbalance here. And this is going to inevitably lead to a crash. Now, it's important to remember that the Great Depression is not isolated to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. And it speaks to how closely interwoven the U.S. economy was with the global economy, even at this early stage. Other countries, Canada, for example, may have been hit harder by the Depression than the U.S. was. The U.S. had been exporting agricultural products and consumer goods to other countries throughout the 1920s. We'd also been financing a lot of loans, especially loans to places like Germany, uh, which, of course, had to repay a bunch of money uh, based upon the Versailles Treaty after World War I. When the Depression hits, the U.S. and other countries end up raising protective tariffs, uh, which only makes the problem worse because now there's no outlet for that overproduction. So we have this contracting of world trade. Uh, we have prices are falling. Governments are facing financial crisis once this supply of American credit just dries up. And many countries adopt this emergency response to the crisis by putting up trade barriers and tariffs. And this only just makes it worse. Uh, so as a direct result, 
to, of the Depression, a lot of countries around the world, we start to see them turning to radical political solutions. For example, uh, Germany's Weimar Republic, uh, it had been very unstable throughout the 1920s. Germany had really only been a democracy for about a little uh, under 10 years uh, by the late 1920s, and they were hit very hard by the Depression. They had been receiving all these loans from America. Now those loans are stopping. Now they cannot, you know, sort of use that money to pay off their war debts and to, you know, sort of buy, uh, you know, produce all the things that they need to produce. So unemployment in Germany just skyrockets, especially in the cities. And we start to see, as a result, the political system starts to veer towards extremism. So we see Hitler's Nazi party coming into power in, June, in January of 1933. Uh, we also see in, this happening in the Western Hemisphere as well. Uh, because the U.S. had been heavily, heavily invested in Latin American economies, they are also severely damaged by the Depression. Uh, and one result of the Depression in the in South America and in Central America is the rise of fascist movements there as well. Now, it's a really interesting question. Why doesn't the U.S. go a similar way? Why does the U.S. not turn to extreme political forms to solve the Depression crisis? Well, some people are genuinely afraid that that might happen, that the Depression meant that American capitalism was going to collapse and that it would lead to social revolution. And all they have to do is look around them at what was going on in American society during the Depression to find evidence that this might actually happen. We kind of, it's hard to imagine now, but the Depression was a really scary time, not just economically, but politically, uh, during the late 1920s and early 1930s. So the effects of the Depression were widespread. They were, you know, sort of massive. Uh, they really hit you know, a huge number of Americans. And this huge number of Americans who were out of work was a very real threat to the stability of the nation. How are all these individuals going to respond to losing their jobs and not having any prospect of finding new ones? Uh, they had lost their jobs. Many people had lost their homes. And the psychological effects of the Depression were really, really real. It's uh, somewhat difficult for us to imagine today how difficult uh, it was for Americans during the Great Depression, facing year after year of poverty with seemingly no end in sight. The hardship of the Depression affected all social classes, all areas of the country, uh, especially the middle class who had been living during the 1920s with these rising expectations of, you know, they were going to do better. Uh, and so it was really difficult for a lot of people. Um, many people found it very hard to ask for charity. Some people ended up, you know, committing suicide, uh, faced with the prospect of losing their job, losing their home. Uh, many Americans moved to try to escape their immediate hardship. Uh, unemployed people stood, for stood in lines for hours waiting for food or relief uh, checks or trying to see if any jobs were available. And I think the picture here on the right uh, really expresses something of how unemployed people must have felt. Uh, this guy who's holding up this sign and he's just begging someone to give him a job. Now, Herbert Hoover was president when the Depression hit. Uh, and he initially tried to keep American spirits up by assuring them that the economy is going to soon turn around. But as the Depression stretches from weeks into months and then into years, his words increasingly rang hollow. He really blamed the Depression on foreign causes, on these unstable European banks. He had an enormous amount of faith in the American economy, and he really couldn't believe that the Depression was due to inherent flaws in the system. And because of that, he rejected a lot of proposals for bold government action. He instead sought the solution to be kind of voluntary cooperation with business. So he calls on private charities and local governments to help feed and clothe the needy. He believes that government handouts are going to undermine America's kind of moral character. Now, the problem is, is that private enterprise and private charity are just overwhelmed. They are simply not capable of coping with the magnitude of the economic crisis. 
eventually, as things become worse and worse, Hoover begins to move beyond voluntarism to kind of passing some more sweeping government measures. He creates a new federal farm board that is designed to loan money to farmers uh, to buy up their surplus crops in an effort to raise farm prices. Congress cuts taxes. They adopt a few federal works projects like the Hoover Dam. Uh, they proposed, he proposed the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in 1932, and this was an agency that was designed to loan money to financial institutions to save them from bankruptcy. But Hoover is still very much opposed to giving direct relief to people. And by 1932, his efforts were clearly failing, and he was widely unpopular. Uh, and you can see that reflected in these shanty towns, these sort of, you know, basically camps of homeless and unemployed people that had sprung up all across the country, they became nicknamed Hoovervilles. Uh, and, you know, they were basically temporary residents of people who had been, uh, who had lost their jobs in their homes. People were sleeping in, you know, boxes and just, you know, open on the ground. Authorities didn't officially recognize these Hoovervilles, and occasionally they would be, you know, they would come in and they would remove the occupants. Um, but they were frequently tolerated because, just out of necessity, I mean, there was nowhere else for these people to go. Uh, and they used Hoover's name because they were really frustrated and disappointed with his involvement in the relief effort for the Depression. So he resists kind of efforts to give direct aid to the unemployed, and he becomes really perceived as indifferent to the suffering of ordinary Americans. And you can see that reflected in this particular episode, uh, which becomes known as the episode of the Bonus Army. The Bonus Army, or the Bonus Expeditionary Force, was in a, a group of about 31,000 World War I veterans uh, who were accompanied by their families uh, who went to Washington, D.C. during the spring and summer of 1932. And they were seeking a immediate cash payment of this bonus that had been granted to them in 1924. Basically, the government had given them a bonus for their service in World War I, and they wanted that bonus to be paid uh, to them now, rather than in 1945 when it had originally said to be uh, redeemed. So the Bonus Army masses at the U.S. Capitol on June 17th, and the Senate at the time is voting on a bill that would have moved forward the date when they could receive this bonus. Uh, most of the Bonus Army were camped outside uh, on the the you know on the uh, the banks of the Potomac in a Hooverville. And the protesters really hoped that they could convince Congress to make these payments that had been granted to the veterans immediately. Uh, and that would have provided relief to the marchers uh, who were unemployed due to the Depression. Uh, these were, you know, sort of veterans who had fought for their country in World War I, and they were now asking their government to help them. The bill had passed the House of Representatives, uh, but it was blocked in the Senate. And so the bill was de eventually defeated. Uh, and Congress uh, appropriated funds to pay for the marchers to go home, and some marchers accepted this money, uh, but others ended up staying. They really wanted, they really believed in their cause, and they wanted to see if they could get Congress to help them. Uh, on July 28th, uh, Washington police attempted to remove some of the remaining Bonus Army protesters from a federal construction site that they had started to occupy. And in the altercation, uh, police fatally shot two veterans. And after that happened, a kind of riot broke out. The protesters then assaulted the police, uh, and several police men were wounded. After the police retreated, the city commissioners of the District of Columbia, they went to President Hoover, and they said, we can no longer maintain the peace. And so Hoover decides to order federal troops in to remove the marchers from the area. So these troops, carrying rifles, their bayonets are unsheathed, they're carrying tear gas, they are sent into the Bonus Army's camps. President Hoover actually did not want the army to go into the largest encampment, but the leader of the army at the time felt that the Bonus Army was a communist attempt to overthrow the government. And so he kind of takes matters into his own hands and he actually disobeys Hoover, Hoover's orders and he goes in. And in this altercation, hundreds of veterans are injured, several people are killed. The army burns down the Bonus Army's tents and shacks. Uh, and 
there are reports that this basically has terrible optics. The reports of U.S. soldiers marching against veterans. This is just disastrous for Hoover. Uh, it does not obviously help Hoover's reelection efforts. Um, and, you know, Hoover had been opposed to the bonus bill. He said we just simply couldn't afford it. Uh, now, his opponent in the election that year, Franklin D. Roosevelt, he didn't want to pay the bonus early either, but he was much more politically savvy than Hoover was, and he handled the veterans with a lot more skill when they marched on Washington again the following year after he had taken office. He ended up sending his wife, Eleanor, to go and talk with the veterans, and, he, uh, and he, she persuaded many of them to sign up for jobs with the New Deal uh, that, that FDR had now put into place. So that's what we're going to talk about for next time. But I think the episode of the Bonus Army really kind of illustrates how by the early 1930s, America is facing a real crisis. We are on the brink of something, and it's not clear what's going to happen. And next time, we'll be talking about how FDR uh, comes in and he establishes what he calls a new deal for the American people. He comes in with a radically different approach to fighting the depression. And we're going to talk about how that approach worked, what elements of it worked and what elements of it didn't, how it was implemented, and you know what the results of that were. So I will see you guys all next time.